Good morning. Glad that you're here with me today. Can you just do something before we start today? Can I ask you to shut your eyes? I just want to ask you to just um, kind of clear your mind to get the distractions away this morning to be able to focus today on what we have um, to share with you. Dear Father, once again, I just put this service in your hands. May you move in the ways that you need to move today. May we hear, may our, our hearts be open, and may we be open to maybe what you have for us. In your name, amen. This gentleman on the PowerPoint this morning, his name is Jared Wilson. Jared Wilson committed suicide on September 9th, Monday evening. Jared is associate pastor for Harvest Christian Fellowship in Riverside, California, under the leadership of Greg Laurie. This next slide is his, is his family that he left behind. Jared was 30 years old. He is quite active in the church, and he even had a nonprofit. But his wife, Julie, shared this the day after he killed himself. Can you show this video? Watch this. This is him playing with his son at a baseball practice. She goes, I can't sleep, so I'm watching this video over and over again. I took this on Monday evening around 7.30 p.m. at our son's base, baseball practice. By 11.45 that night, my sweet husband was in the presence of Jesus. I love you, Jared. I miss you beyond what my heart can stand. Thank you for loving our boys and I with the greatest passion and selflessness I've ever seen in my entire life. I do anything from a hug for you right now. I keep hearing on repeat what you told me all day, every single day. Gosh, I freaking love you. Longing to be with you, longing to make you proud. The boys and I miss you so much. I freaking love you too. So much more than you could ever know. Wish I could tell you that right now. We all do. See, the saddest thing about this is there's many things, but the reason I know Jared is because he works with mental health and because Jared works with mental health, he has a nonprofit organization that's called Anthem of Hope. And this Anthem of Hope, it helps people who struggle on a daily basis. And if you can look at the top there, he has a suicide crisis hotline on his own website for his own nonprofit that he started. But he lost his battle. If you look on his Twitter page or his Instagram, you can see that on Saturday before he committed suicide, he was doing a funeral for a young lady who had also committed suicide. The next Sunday morning, he taught at his church, and after church, he was baptizing people after the service that day. And he was playing with his son three hours before he ended his life. How does that happen? That's one of the saddest stories I've ever heard. Why doesn't the church talk about this? How can we not help each other? Today, I want to share with you many stories about mental health. So whenever I think about it, I, I want to tell you a story from the Bible. Is there any mental health in the Bible of people who love Jesus? The easy one to pick today would be Elijah. Elijah performed a great miracle. Jesus called down fire from the heavens. People killed themselves. And he got so depressed afterwards, he went and sat under a tree and begged God to take him to heaven. 
But that would have been easy. I like, to, I like to stretch your mind. I like to, to see and make you think a little bit. So I think of Paul. Did Paul have some mental illness in the Bible? I mean, before he was Paul, he was Saul, and he was able to, to kill Christians as a fun sport. Until Jesus grabbed him and he changed him. But if you look at some of the scriptures that Paul talks about in the Bible, like in Romans chapter 7, it says that he's talking about the good and evil inside of you. And he goes, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. See, he had this struggle inside of him. And he talks directly to me about that struggle. A lot of times whenever I mess up, it's... I know better, but I do it anyway. Or something that I don't really want to do, but I, man, I just do it. I don't know why. It makes me mad at myself. That internal battle, Paul talked to us about. Somewhere else, he talked about being a a thorn in his side. And we don't know what that thorn was, whether it was an issue that he had or, or maybe a sin that he had, or maybe it was a, a mental illness that he had. But I want to take you to Philippians today. Philippians chapter 1, Paul's in prison in Rome. In the church of Philippi, they sent one of their members to Paul to bring him some gifts and some food and some money to take care of him. So he writes this letter back to the Philippians. And I want to share this verse with you today that you've heard many times. It says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on from living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you. I remain in my body. See, growing up in the church, whenever I read this scripture here, Tina, can you just keep, go back and just leave that there for a second. Whenever I would read this scripture, I always thought Paul was older. I thought he had done most of his ministry And that he was just really done and broken down and worn out. Just like, man, I'd really like to be with Jesus. But then I started studying the scripture. The scripture came to my mind. I started studying it. And Paul's in prison in Rome. And do you know that three years later, Paul was in the same prison in Rome? Three years later. So deep down, that tells me that he didn't know if he was coming back there. And he obviously did come back after that. So he must have had some ministry left. He wasn't old that day. Maybe he was worn out from being beat and being in prison. If you look at the commentaries and study about this, they don't talk about Paul having mental health. They said that he would go on trial and that he could either stop telling people about Jesus or they would kill him. So obviously he wasn't going to stop. But whenever I read that, I can't get past it because it says, yet what shall I choose? And he didn't know he's torn between the two. So I'm here to tell you today that I'm not sure that Paul had mental health problems. But isn't that always how it starts? This life is so rough. I can't go on with what's going on around me. I would rather just go be with Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that what happens when you think about people with suicidal thoughts? They, they say, I cannot stand this any longer. Why should I put up with this? Wouldn't it be better if I could just go be in the presence of Jesus? I think that's where it starts. 
That's where I think it started for Jared. Our scripture today is in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. It says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there's in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, which in Aramaic, Aramaic oh, sorry, is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been there for, had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. I have questions and observations about this scripture. Tina, can you flip it back to the slide where it has the underline? Here's the way I look at it. The questions I have is, I'm trying to get a picture. I'm 43 43 years old today, so 38 wasn't too far ago. And 38 years, I feel like, is a, a very long time. And if I was brought to this pool every day and every day and every day, I would think I could maybe guess at the worst or maybe calculate when the angel might come down and stir that pool so I could beat everybody else there. If not, I would wear everybody else down that was around me so that they'd get tired of me complaining so that they would put me in first. You know? 38 years is a super long time. And then he called him an invalid, and, and really I didn't really know what that was. I thought it was someone who was paralyzed or couldn't move. But he used paralyzed before. So it's someone who's weak and sick. It's weak and sick. What troubles me the most is Jesus had to ask him, do you want to get well? You're talking about a guy who's been there for 38 years. And Jesus actually had to ask him. But you know the other observation I had? Flip this screen there, Tina. Is that he gave an excuse. He didn't answer, yes, I want to get well. He didn't say, yes, Jesus, where have you been? You know what he said? He said, sir, I haven't got anyone to help me into the pool. Why try to get in? Someone always beats me there. He's giving an excuse to Jesus who asked him if he wanted to be well. So what I see in this situation, and this, that this gentleman was okay with the, where he had been. He had been so accustomed to it, it would just become an everyday part of his life. And if people questioned him about it. He just gave an excuse because that's just who he was. But the real reason is the answer is Jesus. You know, the answer is Jesus, always. He's always asking us these questions. And a lot of times we make excuses. Do you want to get well? Man. Let me bring this story a little bit closer to you today. This picture right here is of a young lady called Natalie Haynes. My wife and I, Jen, and I got to meet her because she went on a nine-month mission trip with my son. 
Natalie is 21 years old today, and whenever she was in high school, she went through some rough times. You see, Natalie got bullied in school a little bit, and started running with a with the wrong crowd, and didn't have much self worth. And while she was in high school, she she tried to commit suicide two times. But the pain that she had was so great that she thought that she needed to control her pain so she would make slice marks in her arms. Not these little white scars that you see sometimes for people who might cut themselves. She has welts from her battles that go up and down her arms. Her parents didn't know what to do, so they sent her to a treatment facility. And while she was there, she was able to get the help that she needed, turn her life around, and follow Jesus, and went on a work and witness trip with my son. But then there became a problem. When she was done, it was time for her to go home. And this home was the same place where she had committed suicide and cut herself and had these wrong group of friends that she was scared to be part of. So she's looking for somewhere to go. And she calls Hunter and she asks if she could come to Westville, Ohio. And that's been here for just a little over a year. And man, she's had a hard time. She's, she stayed with Lynn and Doris and she's trying to get involved. But Nat is working hard and, and she is winning today. Nat has some bad days, but she is winning today because she is putting in the work. So much so that she's going to be an RA for the safe house for our out of darkness Columbus for the next year. That's crazy. Crazy. Let me bring it a little bit closer. This is my son. Hunter. Today, I'll sit up here and tell you, Hunter is wrecked with anxiety. You see, whenever Hunter was in fifth or sixth or seventh grade, we figured out that he had ADD, had a hard time focusing and and staying on task and staying organized. And from the outside, you would never know it because Hunter is social and everybody knows him and everybody loves him. But he struggled through school. He decided to go on this nine-month mission trip because he didn't know if he could do college. But then whenever he was done with that mission trip, he had to come home. And all of his friends were gone. They were at college. And Hunter didn't know if he could do college. So we helped him and we sent him away to Liberty for a semester where he failed miserably. You see, anxiety is fear of the future and Hunter has no idea what his future looks like. And because of his ADD, he can't even see past tomorrow. All he'll tell me is that I hate being here, Dad. And I don't know what I want to do. This anxiety, it wrecks him so much that he cannot sleep at night. Because every time he closes his his eyes to sleep, his mind starts racing. And he can't get any rest.
That's Jen and I's life for the past couple of years. You say, Scott, why are you telling us these stories? Because here's, here's what sticks out most to me today is that Jared loved Jesus. Paul loved Jesus. Natalie loved Jesus. Hunter loves Jesus. Natalie was a missionary kid who spent 10 years in Kenya with her parents as a missionary and came back to the States when she was 16, and then that's where it went downhill. Hunter has grown up in this church every day since he was one year old. How can people who love Jesus have mental health problems, who are wrecked with anxiety and depression and have suicidal thoughts? I don't get it. I don't know what the answers are. But here's the scripture that I have for today for us all. In John 10, 10, it says, The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You see, here's what I do know. I know Jesus wants you to have life to the full. But how do you get there? Or why do we have these problems? In the small time that I've been looking and talking to people and, and looking around, I see these certain things that keep resurfacing. So a lot of these problems... They're consequences of other people's sin in your life. A lot of people have problems because they have sexual assault or physical assault or verbal assault. You've been assaulted and it wasn't even your fault. It's somebody else's. Or maybe some of you went through a traumatic experience. Maybe a death that sent you into depression. Maybe it was an abortion that you had a long time ago that you can't ever get over. Maybe it was a divorce in your family that wrecked the whole family. A traumatic experience. Maybe it's something that's inherited. You ever hear this? My great grandfather was a drunk. Then Uncle John was a drunk. And now I have a problem with alcohol. Can you inherit alcoholism that goes through your family? Or Grandma dealt with depression, and Aunt Lisa has some depression, and I have depression. You think you can inherit those, those things from passed down through generation? Absolutely. Or maybe today, it may just be because at a time in the past you messed up. Maybe it's your own sin. Maybe you can't forgive yourself because of something that you've done. But I'm here to tell you today that I serve a resurrected Jesus who is ready to heal you today. So I go back to what Jesus asked the invalid at the pool. I want to say, do you want to get well? You're sitting here today. Do you want to get well? You see, I'm here to tell you that I believe that Jesus can heal you on the spot before you leave today. I believe that. But maybe to your shock, I'm going to tell you that I believe in medicine. 
I believe in counseling, therapy. I believe in whatever it takes to be able to make you, to be able to live your life to the full. Whatever it takes. And I'm here today to tell you that Jen and I, my wife and I, are taking up this cross and battle there for you. So my question is, is do you want to get well? Do you want to be well? It's going to take some work. But you can't give the excuse that the invalid did. You can't say, well, I've always dealt with this. I'm not sure if I really had depression. It only comes during the holiday season. No, do you want to be well? It affects every part of your life. No matter if you're the oldest person here or the youngest, it affects your life. So in closing today, I just have one question. Would one or two or three or ten have the courage to stand where you're at and say, I want to be healed. I want to be well. Would anyone stand today and say, would you like to be well? Because if you stand, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up with you. I'm going to work with you. My wife is going to help you. and We're going to work together. But the question is, is do you want to be well? Does anyone want to stand today? Now's your time. Four out of every 10 people suffer from mental illness at some point. Casey is just going to end us with a chorus that we've never sang here before. It's pretty easy to follow along. You can stand and sing it. You could, you can come and pray this morning. But I really want to know if you want to be well. It may look like I'm surrounded 
shelter, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I find my battle. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Before we close in prayer, I just want to make this promise to you today: that if you ever, ever need anything, I'm always here for you. My wife is always there for you. Let's close the prayer today. Dear Jesus, we talk about things sometimes that we don't understand. And a lot of times during Father, we don't even talk about it in the church. And the problem is, is we, we pass by people every day and we can't even tell that they're struggling. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for for healing today. That people will be healed in your name. That they will live life to the full. Dear Jesus, please bless us as we leave. May you continue to work on our hearts. In your name.